Thanks so much uh, for coming this morning, uh, for joining us. Um, because the defendants uh, need to get into the courthouse, we're going to try and keep this uh, really short. Uh, we were out yesterday in the very, very cold weather, and so this feels like, I and mean, this almost feels like summer out here today. So, uh, but we do need to uh, get into the courthouse. So, uh, we'll be moving this along uh, quite quickly, actually. So, why are we here? Right, we're here because our friends are on trial. Uh, Brian, Josie, Mike Levinson, uh, Carmen Trotta, uh, and Judith Kelly are on trial. There, they were uh, five of 14 who rose in the Citizens Gallery of the House of Representatives on June 23rd. On that same day, legislators were debating provisions that would eventually become what we now know as the National Defense Authorization Act. They rose one by one uh, to address the ongoing crime, sanctioned, financed, and approved by far too many of those men and women standing on the floor, sitting on the floor of the House of Representatives, the ongoing crime of Guantanamo. They were charged with making a disruption. And after the government failed to positively identify nine of them, five began trial before a jury yesterday. Uh, if found guilty and given the maximum, they could face up to a year in prison for this disruption. What is the disruption? Is standing and imploring and begging and demanding a disruption? No, it's not. Our friends who are defending themselves uh, are pro se uh, with the help of uh, legal counsel, uh, Mark Goldstone and Ann Wilcox. No, they will say that was not a disruption. The disruption is torture. The disruption is indefinite detention. The disruption is a pervasive sheen of impunity and criminal lack of accountability. That is disruptive. <clears throat> Congress's cowardly recalcitrance on all of these issues is disruptive. Obama's cruel, deceitful signing of the National Defense Authorization Act, that's disruptive. So I'll ask now uh, Carmen Trotta, Josie Selzer, Mike Levinson, and Brian Hines to just sort of step forward and, and be on the side here. So, do these look like people who would cause a disruption? No. No. They look like people who are naming a greater disruption, naming the disruption of cruel, inhuman, unusual treatment of human beings, right? Naming the disruption of torture, naming the disruption of indefinite detention, naming the disruption of cruelty and torture. Now, uh, in just a minute, I'll ask Josie Selzer to come forward. Josie's a grandmother, a human rights advocate uh, who comes uh, to us from Fremont, Ohio, a member of Witness Against Torture. She'll speak on the behalf of the five defendants, besides these four, there's Judith Kelly, uh, who's not here yet, and share her motivations uh, for addressing Congress in June. After she speaks, uh, Jeremy Varon will speak. Uh, hopefully he gets here. Uh, Jeremy is a professor of history at the New School University in New York City. He's a member of Witness Against Torture. And, uh, and he'll speak to why the timing of this trial is so important, given the recent signing of the NDAA and the swell of activism for human rights that we're seeing, uh, that this trial um, and all of us who are fasting here in Washington are a part of. Um, so Josie, if you'd come forward now. Thank you, Frida. Yesterday, the trial began. The jury has been seated, and it is our privilege to address the hearts and minds of our fellow citizens on the jury. That's what due process is about in this country, and we have that right here in this country. We get to, we're defending ourselves today, and we get to speak to these charges. Some other people 
are not able to do that. Those detainees that still remain in Guantanamo are not able to do that. We felt an urgency in June when we went to the gallery of the House of Representatives. I personally felt an urgency the day before when I heard that the provisions, certain provisions in the National Defense Authorization Act would actually write into hard law a prohibition for these detainees to go to be released. Many of these men have been cleared by our own government, and yet Congress was ready then and has since made into hard law the impossibility of their release. Men held innocent by our own government and they remain detained. How can this be? And that's what I said to myself that night before. How can this be? And how, after all of our efforts for years to speak to Congress, to speak uh, to various levels of government, executive and legislative, uh, and to the American people, things were getting worse instead of better. And how could Congress do this very outrageous thing? How can this be? I had to speak. If I did not speak, I would be complicit. It's a privilege to be speaking here on behalf of my four co-defendants and on behalf of the other arrestees, many of whom are behind me right now, taking on the persona of people in Guantanamo right now. Now today, we continue with the trial under rather restrictive limits that were imposed on us yesterday. Before the jury came into the jury box and the trial began, the prosecutor did make an in limine motion to, to limit what this trial could be about and what we could talk about. That th we were not going to put Guantanamo on trial, but we are putting our, ho our own hearts and minds on trial. We are doing that ourselves and there are ways in which we can speak from the heart within the narrow limits that have been imposed on us. And one of our co-defendants, Mr. Carmen Trotta, delivered the opening remarks yesterday under those restrictions, within those narrow limits, and was able to speak from our hearts to the hearts of the jurors about how we were compelled to speak out about this wrong. Sure, we're not going to argue policy in the next days. We are going to argue from our conscience. We will not be complicit. Our, our, our fellow members of our community will not be complicit. They will come into the courtroom today with us to support us. Other members of the greater area here will come in and support us. And we ask the media to bring the hearts and minds of the American people into the courtroom with us. Members of the media, too, can find a way not to be complicit. We will speak today. We will be in solidarity with each other today. And we and my co-defendants here are grateful for your solidarity. Thank you. Uh, so we have one ad additional speaker before uh, Professor Varen comes on. I'm just going to ask Tom Casey from uh, Buffalo, New York, one of uh, the people who spoke out in Congress on June 23rd, whose case, is, uh, whose case was dismissed, uh, to speak briefly about that experience. Speaking for the nine of us who were dismissed, I can say we were all disappointed not to be standing with our brothers and sisters over a mere identification issue. I can echo what Josie said. E each of us stood because we felt we had no choice, morally, religiously, constitutionally, spiritually. Our country has descended into gross violations of moral and constitutional behavior including torture that on many of our forefathers condemned as something that Imperial England did. So we are thankful to be here today. We stand and we hope as many people as possible join us to correct the course of our country. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. So I also just want to take a moment to welcome Judith Kelly, the fifth uh, co-defendant uh, from Arlington, Virginia, um, uh, up here uh, with the other co-defendants. And now I'll welcome Jeremy Varon uh, to the stage. Um, as I said before, Jeremy is a professor of history at the New School University, and, uh, and we'll talk about the NDAA and other matters. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out uh, so early and on a cold day. Um, on June 23rd, when the alleged disruption of Congress took place, the House of Representatives was debating the so-called Defense Appropriations Bill, and this was part of a bundle of legislation culminating in the National um, Defense Authorization uh, Appropriations Act, which was passed recently by both houses of Congress, and despite the veto threat, signed into law a couple of days ago by President Obama. And what I'd like to do briefly is indicate how we expressed our protest in June and what connection our words and actions had to the NDAA. Uh, in June, in the gallery, and I was there, 14 activists, um, many of them behind me, rose by one by one to recite portions of the following statement. Quote, today the House of Representatives is in the process of contemplating not the passage of a bill, but the commission of a crime. Provisions in the proposed defense appropriations bill grant the United States powers over the lives of detained men, fitting of a totalitarian state that uses the law itself as an instrument of tyranny. The law would make the prison at Guantanamo permanent by denying funds for the transfer of men to the United States even for the prosecution in civilian courts. Abandoning such courts, the bill would be the ultimate concession that the rule of law and cherished American values cannot survive the fear and hatred that have consumed this country. The proposed bill makes restrictions on the transfer of detainees, even to foreign countries, so severe that no one, whether cleared for release by our own government or acquitted in trials, could be expected to leave Guantanamo. It therefore mandates the indefinite detention even of innocent human beings, which is the very essence of tyranny. Congress has an obligation to uphold the U.S. Constitution. All Americans have the obligation to defend human rights. The proposed bill makes America a callous and reckless jailer, unworthy of the name democracy. Guantanamo must close. Those unjustly bound must be freed. Justice must rule. We spoke those words in June because they were good and true, because they needed to be said, and because they needed to be heard by Congress, by the President, by the media, and by the American public. We hope that the judge will allow them to be heard by the jury. Indeed, the NDA is a terrible piece of legislation whose effect is to codify into law a set of dangerous and controversial policies and protocols that have evolved over the last 10 years. As I said, it makes Guantanamo a permanent part of the U.S. detention regime. And this is really tragic. At precisely the time when the United States should be acting to dismantle a criminal apparatus that is Guantanamo, at the time when it should be investigating what went wrong, prosecuting those responsible for lawless detention and torture, and offering apologies and restitution to the victims. At just this time, we are committing more deeply to policies of indefinite detention without charge or trial and the maintenance of a shameful offshore gulag. The NDAA represents perhaps the final nail in the coffin of Obama's failed promise of closing Guantanamo. To many of us, this is the signal moral failure of his administration and hopefully something that the electorate will consider as it uh, chooses who to cast its vote for. Um, to reiterate, one of the provisions in the NDAA makes it almost impossible to transfer anybody from Guantanamo. And what this means is a practical matter, that the 50 or so Yemeni men cleared for release by the U.S. government may never go home. That others cleared for release by the U.S. government or who won their habeas petitions and were ordered free by federal judges may never go home. So the sad fact is the United States is knowingly jailing and claims the right to continuously jail innocent men indefinitely without charge or trial for no sound national security reason, 
simply because it's politically inconvenient to release them. I'll close with a couple of points. I'm a historian, and sometimes the law uh, is radically contrary to justice. And in such moments, people of conscience, conscience must stand up for the true moral meaning of the law and sometimes break the law in the name of justice. And I'm not saying that that's what happened here. Indeed, they're going to argue that they did not materially disrupt the affairs of Congress. But this is a righteous group of people moved by conscience, acting on behalf of millions of people in the United States and around the world to do the right thing. And then the last point I would like to make is that the NDAA is depressing. A setback in a decade of setbacks. The good news is that Americans in droves are appropriately concerned and outraged. There's more attention to detention issues in the last three weeks than possibly the last five years combined. And then this means that there's a real opportunity for people throughout the political spectrum to question in new ways the powers that the government has appropriated and seized and mobilized to start undoing these terrible laws. I'm fully convinced Guantanamo will not close because of executive orders or the goodwill of the president. It will only close if people rise up, um, organize to stop this outrage, and we see that happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so uh, we're going to wrap up now. I invite you to speak uh, directly to the defendants uh, standing here before you, um, and also to those uh, uh, nine clear defendants um, who are sort of uh, clustered over to the to the right here, uh, Tom and the others. I'll just say two more things. One, we hope that you all come into the courtroom uh, with us this morning. Uh, among other things, it's very warm in the courtroom. Uh, watch the proceedings and continue to follow uh, this case throughout the week. Also invite you to join us on Wednesday, January 11th in Lafayette Park at noon. Uh, there we will rally along with Amnesty, the Center for Constitutional Rights and a broad coalition to mark and decry 10 years of Guantanamo and the ongoing crime of Bagram and call once again for the end to torture and the beginning of accountability. Uh, on January 11th, we'll move from Lafayette Park to the White House, the Department of Justice, the Capitol, and the Supreme Court, visiting each of the institutions we hold responsible for these policies, these gross miscarriages of justice. There's more information about all of these activities on uh, our website, which is witnesstorture.org. Um, and once again, thank you, everybody, and we close this uh, press conference now.